Um, before we get into the scripture this morning, my, uh, baptism is one of my favorite things. And um, it, it's right up there with tithing for me. Tithing is one of my favorite things because, because I, can't, I can't cover my whole life and I don't have control over everything that's going on in my kids' lives and in my family's lives. And money represents something in my life. It represents my ability to take care of my family, doesn't it? It represents what I do for a living, but that's sometimes not enough. And, and I know that God's got me. And so when I tithe, it's a declaration of this is my trust in the Lord. And so that's my favorite thing. And then another favorite thing is baptism. Um, the, the word baptism, I heard somebody tell me one time, and I don't know if this is true, but it's super cool, so I'm going to say it anyways. Because I, I haven't been able to confirm this, but they said the oldest written re- record of the word baptismo is in a pickling recipe. And there's this, this uh, you know, because it, it means to be completely surrounded and inundated with something. To be baptized in something is to be completely surrounded and soaked through and I kind of want to be pickled in Jesus, right? I mean, just for, him, for me to sit down in Jesus and for him to change the very nature of who I am, right? And the picture I get when I think of baptism is, is when we used to go camping and we'd go to the, there'd be these places that we'd go swimming and we'd st- get up on these big cliffs and, and we'd jump into the water. And I say big cliffs you know, it puts in mind something that's really tall, but it was probably only like 10 or 12 feet, right? So, so we're jumping in, and there's this idea that there's this decision that you make to step off the cliff. And if you make that decision, you're, all, you're up there and you're kind of scared and you're like, all I got to do is make, take that step, right? I just got to take that step off of that. And then you hit the water and it's almost immediately you're surrounded by this cold, refreshing water that's all around you. And to me, that's a picture of baptism, that when you are baptized into the Lord, you are surrounded by him on every side and you're soaked through. And it's just a really cool picture. And so we're going to talk about um, that this morning, but we're going to start in Romans chapter three, which is my favorite chapter of Romans. Because it talks about the grace that, that God's given us in our lives. Starting in verse 10, it says, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace, they do not know. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. This is a really important scripture for us because in order to have a Savior, we have to know what we're being saved from. We've got to know what, why we need a Savior. And, and the truth of the matter is that there are no good people. There's no good. There's not one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. There's none of us that who in our own power, in our own flesh, are good. And so that kind of puts to rest the whole argument about arguing about who's good and who's not, doesn't it? We're kind of all in the same boat. We all need an answer for the condition of our flesh. I'm going to need this on. It can't turn off on me. That's not going to be good. Okay. So we need an answer for for the the state of our unrighteousness in God. And it's interesting what it says here. It says that even if you follow the law, now the law is kind of a Bible word that maybe doesn't mean a lot to some of us, but if you think of the law as a standard of righteousness, it's a measurement that says, here's what it looks like to be righteous. This is what it looks like to be righteous, and it's a measuring stick that we can hold up against ourselves and say, this is what that looks like. And that's what the 
the purpose that the law fulfilled in the Old Testament and even going into the New Testament. But it says here that no one, even following the law, will be declared righteous. So even if you did all of the things in the law, you're still not righteous. But what does the law do? It says it makes us conscious of our sin. So it's like if you have a little, bunch of little rugrats running around and they are out of control. And they are, anybody experienced that before? Yeah, anybody with kids, right? So you have these kids running around, they're out of control, but you have no rules or regulations in your house, right? Then, then there's no revelation of what it is that they're doing wrong, right? There's no, there's no standard to say, here's the standard that we live by. They, they just run around and, and there's no accountability. But if you say, here's the standard, what we live by, and you write it down, you put it on the wall and say, here's the expectations that I have of you. How many of you know that, that if that happens on Tuesday, on Wednesday, they're not actually still not behaving themselves, right? Because, because it just doesn't, it's not magic. It doesn't say, okay, we wrote the rules down and now everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. But now there's an accountability. You can hold their behavior up next to them and say, hey, here's some ways that you're not doing what is expected of you in the house, right? So you have something to hold, hold accountable. And that's like the law in our life there was never any expectation that God would give us a law and say, this is the expectation, this is what righteousness looks like, and then people were going to do that and be righteous. You cannot be righteous by following the law. And the reason is, is because righteousness is the nature of who we are. It doesn't have to do with the behavior. The behavior is a product of who we are. Righteousness has to do with the state of being of who we are. If you skip forward to... Um, a little bit further, I will skip ahead and read this part. It says, verse 23, so for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, that's a really important scripture. Here's a standard of righteousness. All have sinned and fall short of the standard. The standard, the glory of God. Okay, here's the problem. On my best day, I'm not hitting that mark. Right? Is anybody else with me? Like, like Tuesday, glory of God, nailed it. No. Like, like on my best day, I'm not hitting that mark. And the thing about righteousness is it doesn't come in degrees. You're either completely righteous or you're completely unrighteous. So you can't be like, well, I got close. Scripture says if you're guilty of, of, of breaking one of the laws, you're guilty of breaking them all. So, so sin, my youth pastor used to tell me, don't drink, don't chew, and don't go with the girls that do. <laughs> and that was kind of a definition of sin, is like, don't do these things. But the problem with that is that even if I behave myself, my heart is wicked. The nature of who I am it's wicked, and I'm, I'm not just, it's not that just I sin every once in a while, it's that my heart is in a perpetual state of sin. I need an answer for that. I need an answer for that state of my heart. And that's what makes this rest of the scripture so powerful to me. That's what makes chapter 3 the one that stands out to me in, in Romans. Starting in verse 21, it says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the, through the redemption that came from Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. That, that's amazing, and it's mind-boggling. And if you, you have to think about it for a second before you really start to grab the gravity of that scripture. Now we have a righteousness apart from the law. That one statement is mind-blowing. So here's a righteousness in our lives. 
that has nothing to do with what we do or don't do, but is completely based on our faith in Jesus Christ. That's mind-blowing, isn't it? Now a righteousness apart from the law has been made known. Meaning that I don't define my righteousness by my behavior, but I define it by my faith and my trust in Jesus. Where it says that all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came in Christ Jesus. I want to give you a little bit of definition here because the word justified is super cool. Um, The word justice means that something is made righteous. And I want to unpack that a little bit. So let's back up to the word righteous. The word righteous in the Bible means that you have right relationship with somebody. It's not a, you can't be unrighteous by yourself. It's a relational word. So if you're righteous, it means that you're, you have right relationship with somebody. And that can be between my, me and my son or me and Keith. If our relationship is righteous, it means that there's nothing between us. There's no wrongdoing between us. We have good relationship. It, it changes a little bit when you start talking about God because he's God and he's Lord, right? And so if we have right relationship with God, then we're righteous. So... Um, Justice is to make somebody righteous. If, if I, when we think of justice, we think of a courtroom word, don't we? Like we're going to go into uh, to court and we're going to have justice. But what's happening in court, retributive justice, is that you go into court and if Keith stole $100 from me, the judge is going to say, hey, Keith, you got to give that $100 back in, in, in some restitution, right? What's he doing? He's making our relationship right as much as the courtroom can do that, okay? But restorative justice is different. If, if I'm walking along and I have a bunch of food and I see somebody that's hungry, there's no righteousness between us. But if I give that person food, I'm doing justice to that person. I'm making that relationship right. And so this word is really cool. Justice means that, that somebody that's out of right relationship is being taken and pulled back up into right relationship. And so when it says that Jesus justified us, that he's a God of justice, doesn't mean, it, when it says that Jesus, that God is a God of justice, doesn't mean that those guys are going to get what they deserve. It means that he's doing justice to us. He's taking people that are hurting, that are not in right relationship, that are disconnected from him, and he's pulling them back up into right relationship with them. He's pulling them back up into right relationship. Our God has given us a righteousness, a right relationship with him that doesn't have anything to do with what we do or don't do but it's wholly based on our faith and our trust in him, and he will justify us. He will pull us up into right relationship with him. So you go back to to baptism. Baptism is not the thing that the Lord was speaking to me this week about baptism is that we can't be partially righteous. And there's a problem with the idea that I'm going to come to Jesus with my life and the mess that it is and all the things that, that are not of him and that he's going to l- take little pieces and make them righteous. That doesn't work. There's a whole work that needs to happen in our lives, right? And so we go to, to Romans chapter 6. Starting in verse 3, it says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. 
For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life He lives, He lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I'll read that first part again. It says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. The decision that we make for Jesus, when we make him Lord of our life, the decision we make isn't for him to come and change pieces of us. I've I've said before that God's not a condiment. God's not strawberry jam that you spread on your life to make it taste better. You can't just take the, you can't put put makeup on the pig. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't just take something that's dead. The Bible says that we're living dead. You can't take, take the zombie and make it look alive, but we are baptized with Christ into his death. Meaning that that old man that you bring to him, he doesn't just change pieces. You're, you, you put it to death, the whole thing. It goes down into the grave with Jesus. You're, you're burying that old person that you, you were before you met Jesus. And because you're crucified with Him and because you're put into the ground with Him, you're brought out in the newness of life and everything is made new. Newness of life. Resurrected in the image of Jesus. The picture of baptism when somebody goes into the water is a picture of them going down into death with Christ, being crucified with Christ and being buried. And when they come out of the water, it's symbolic of the new life that they're going to live in Jesus. The new life that they're going to live in Jesus. That's why Jesus in our lives is more than principles that we try to live by. It's power and presence in our lives to be His. When you come out of the water, actually, it's symbolic, but when you meet Jesus and you're saved and He washes you and you're resurrected again with Him, you're completely righteous. You're completely righteous. That's hard for us to wrap our minds around, isn't it? Why is that hard for us to wrap our minds around? Because we know us. Right? Everybody say, I am righteous. You don't like to say that, do you? Everybody does say, like, because Jesus died for me, wants to put the qualifier. Yeah, absolutely. We're only righteous because Jesus died for us. We're only righteous because his blood washes us and makes us so. But the fact is, is that we are righteous in him. So what happens when you mess up? You're still righteous. Why? Because your righteousness is not based on the law. It's based on your faith in Jesus. The nature of your righteousness, the nature of your new self, is not that you do everything right. It's not that you are made righteous and therefore now I don't make mistakes. Has that been anybody's experience? Right? No. So either... Either the righteousness is broken or it doesn't work that way, right? The righteousness that we have in Christ is not that we come out and we don't make mistakes anymore. It's that we have faith in Jesus. 
there's this, this false belief that the nature of a Christian is to not do anything wrong or to try to get as close to that as possible. And I think it's intimidating sometimes for people that, that don't know him and, and don't know that make assumptions that all these people that are sitting in church either don't do anything wrong or they think that they don't do anything wrong. That can, that can be intimidating for people that don't really know what it means to be righteous in Christ, can't it? There's a the misconception that if you're a good Christian, you don't mess up anymore. But, but the na- that's not the nature of a Christian person at all. The nature of a Christian person is conflict. The nature of us when we're righteous in Christ and we're his is conflict. Galatians uh, 5, 16 through 18 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. It's actually one of the requirements to being a Christian is that you're in conflict. The nature of what it means to be a Christian is that you have the Spirit of God in your life and it desires certain things and it wants you to live a certain way because it loves you and you have the fleshly nature in your life that wants different things. And the Spirit of God in your life and the fleshly nature in your life are in conflict with one another. So if there's a word that describes Christians and the nature of what it means to be a Christian, I think conflict is a good word because we're trying to live for Jesus, but we don't want to. It says you're not to do what you want, right? There's things we want to do, and there's things that the Spirit of God's going, you probably shouldn't do that, right? (laughs) And sometimes we do it anyways. And there's this, and then he kind of convicts us, and there's this wrestling match. For the Christians in the room this morning that have been walking with the Lord a long time, have you experienced wrestling with God before? Yes. Why? Because the word conflict kind of defines what's going on with us. <laughs> it's. it's I've said before, I said, one of my jobs as a pastor is to offend you sometimes. And if you've been in this church and there's, there, you haven't been offended for the last six months, you're probably in the wrong church. Your flesh ought to be offended when it comes to church. There ought to be something of, if you're growing in your life, that means you're wrestling with something. If you've gone six months to a year and you're like, yeah, I'm good, I think I'm done. Take me out of the oven. (laughs) Isn't God so faithful to bring up the next thing when it's time to do that? (laughs) But he's also faithful to give us those rest periods. Rest periods are kind of like summer break, though. They never last quite long enough. God is faithful. You you know, and that's that's why (laughs) also the nature of our walk is not to get finished with the work. Do you know that, that the purpose of Christianity is not to make us better people? It's to make us better at relationship. The purpose is to, to learn to love God and to love people. The trap that we fall into is that we think that God's trying to finish this work of righteousness in our life, but sin's kind of like a Pez dispenser. You open it up, you take one out, you're like, oh, I'll deal with that. Then you open it up, there's another one. Right? And if, you, if your life becomes trying to get to the end of that, that's, you're missing out on all this relationship with God that you could be having along the journey, aren't you? The purpose is for God to love you for who you are right now and to walk with you through that journey and bring that stuff in front of you when it's time, not because he's angry that you're doing something, but because he loves you too much not to. He loves you too much not to. So when you see, you look around the room of the people in here, 
These aren't a group of people that are peaceful people floating around on cloud nine because they're Christians and they're just, you know, two heavenly, what my mom used to say, uh, too heavenly present, do any earthly good or something like that. I don't know. It was an old saying that they're not people that are just floating around and they've got all their problems worked out. These are a people that are warring in here. They're a warring people. The people in here that love God have somebody in here that they're praying for. They have people they're praying for, that they're warring for, that have things in their own life that they're putting before the Lord. They have challenges that God's put in front of them that they're, they're, they're trying to, you know, the, the thing that gets me is when, just when I think I'm doing good, and the Lord says, I want you to give me that. And I'm like, you wanted me to give you what, Lord? And I'm just white knuckle gripping something. And he goes, I want you to give me that. And sometimes the thing he's asking me for is ministry or something I'm doing. Something he asked me to do in the first place. Right? Let's become my identity. He's like, I want you to give that back to me. You know, there's always challenges that God, the people in here are warring people. What are we warring for? We're warring to be his. We're fighting to be his. We're fighting to love him well and to experience the love that he has for us. Because that's what we want, but our flesh doesn't want that. Our flesh doesn't want that. I'll tell you that, that if you're beginning your journey with the Lord and you haven't been walking with Him for very long, there's gold in this room. There's men and women in this room that have been warring for a long time and know some tricks, some tips and tricks, some life hacks on how to, how to serve Him. That, that has some, you know what? The, the, the only thing... Anybody seen Braveheart? Right? I, I, anytime I think of a big battle, I think of these, these visceral things in Braveheart where they're just going out there and it's just a bloody battle. And, and I think about that as spiritual. That's the fight that we're in. We're in a fight. And the only thing worse than being in a fight is being in a fight naked. Picture that. That's terrible, right? <laughs> it, if I'm going to go into a fight, I want to be equipped. I want to know that I'm in a fight. And I'm going to tell you that you're all in a fight. And if you think you're not in a fight or you're pretending not to be in a fight, you're still in a fight. And there's people in here that can help you get equipped for that fight. There's people in here who have learned to use their weapons of the warfare and and, and, and dug out the scriptures and, and been in the Word to learn things about how to war. And you could learn some stuff from them. I just want to say that being baptized doesn't mean that you've won the battle. It means that you, you've made a decision to belong to Jesus. It represents your righteousness in Christ because of your faith in Him. Because you died with Him and were resurrected again in the newness of life. And it represents the beginning of the conflict in your life. The beginning of conflict. The old saying says, if you haven't bumped shoulders with the devil today, maybe you're going in the same direction. Right? <laughs> We're about to take communion, and I, I want to say that another thing about baptism is that we all get to be baptized into the same Savior. There's a unity that's represented in the fact that we've all been baptized into Christ, that we've all chosen Him. There's this picture when I was praying about baptism of the Holy Spirit about a year ago, I think. There's this really cool picture that God gave me because I was thinking about baptism of the Holy Spirit and that God puts his spirit in one person and another person and another person. And um, I was reading about how the spirit that God puts us in is the same spirit, right? It's not, he's not divided. So God gave me this picture of these human-shaped sponges, that's us, falling into the ocean that is the Holy Spirit. So it's not that we're 
we're each getting a little piece of the Holy Spirit. It's that we're all falling into and being soaked with and being baptized in the Holy Spirit who is huge. And we all have the same Spirit in us. Because we've all been baptized into the same Christ. Uh, Dan, could you uh, pass out the, the elements this morning? I want to read a couple of scriptures to us. You know, we, we feel very strongly here that, that the point of the gospel has to do with each other as well as God. You know, none of these letters were written to a, an individual. They were all written to a group of people. And God designed his church so that we serve and we seek him together. And so the body of believers is, is a very important part of what God's doing in our lives. We have this attitude in the Northwest. We're very independent people in the Northwest, aren't we? And, and we have this thing I call the you're not the boss of me Christianity. You know, where my walk with God is mine. It has nothing to do with you, and I'm going to do it the way that I want to do it. But, you know, yeah, you've got to make a decision for Christ yourself, but I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you that that's not the way that God designed his body. He says that we're all pieces of the same body. One of you is a hand and, and one of you is an eye. And he says, what good is the eye without the ear? And, and we need each other to be functional and to be whole. Everything that happens in the body of Christ happens to a group of people, not an individual. God has chosen to use other people to be a part of what you have with him. That's a hard thing for some of us to swallow a little bit, isn't it? I'm going to take your, take your bread this morning. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 10, verse 15 says, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break in participation of the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. And there's this picture with this. Is that the bread that I'm taking in some symbolism of his body being broken is the same one that you're taking. And I eat of Christ. The bread that's in me is the same bread that's in you. The same piece of bread. That's a picture of unity. And so as we take this this morning, Lord, as we put it up before you, we thank you for the work that you've done, the miracle that you've done, that you can be in us as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, what we eat, Lord, as we take in and we make a part of ourselves who you are, Lord. And, and we love you this morning. And we thank you for the gift that you've given us in your body, Lord. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 says, Just as one body... Though one has many parts, but all of its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And so we come before you this morning, Lord, as we drink the cup, we let it represent the Spirit that we drink in you, Lord, and we just thank you for the work that you've done, for the blood that you shed for our sins. Though we are many in this room, let us be one in you, Lord. Let us love you well and love each other well. In Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. I want to celebrate that with you this morning. If any of you desires to be baptized next week, if any of you says, I want to put that body in the ground again because it just needs to be, and you want to come out and you, you want to experience that freshness of life and make a declaration for Christ in that way next week, then I invite you to join us. And uh, for the rest of us, let's just come and participate with those who do. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us this morning. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ, whom I love very much, Lord. Thank you for loving us well and, and for teaching us to also to love. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys.